Hello, I'm Stuart. Hello, I'm Liam. And we need to come up with a name for our podcast. We do. So this is the third episode of our podcast. Welcome back. Hopefully by the time we have a fourth episode, we'll have a name for this. (laughs) Thank you to everyone who supported us on Kickstarter for the fundraising campaign for Zine Quest for Advanced Ancient Academy. The book is now available in both print and PDF on DriveThruRPG, and I'll put a link in the show notes. So today, we're going to talk about how to prep for a new campaign. Mm -hmm. We both ran campaigns, uh, both in 5e and Old School Essentials, so these will be notes on Campaigns you could use on a variety of different RPGs. Sort of system neutral. Yeah. Yeah. So some things work better in some campaigns, some work better in in others, but uh, uh, these are our thoughts on this. And Liam and I both have different ideas on a few of them, similar ideas on some others. So this will be an interesting discussion, I think. So let's start with session zero. So... Yeah, uh, do you want to start, or... Do you run Session Zero when you start a new campaign? When I start a new campaign, I always try to run Session Zero, but I find if you're playing games, especially online, and you try to do a Session Zero, people won't really... They won't really value it, and they'll, they'll show up, and then they'll decide that they need to leave and do something else, or they'll they'll get up and they'll, they'll go do, like... They, like, they need to eat, or they need to just go off and do something else. And I don't, I don't blame them for doing that. But at the same time, I feel like session zeros are a very, very good tool. I've just been unlucky with, with doing them, especially online as people tend to, uh, to sort of leave for large periods of it. And then you aren't able to sort of convey everything you'd like to. Yeah. And for people who don't know session zero, the idea is before you actually start running the game, you have a session where everyone gets together probably builds their characters together and and comes to a shared understanding of what the game is going to be like. Now, Liam, you've done more online games than I have. I actually haven't run a a huge number of online games. I've run a few. So most of my experience is with in-person. And I'm going to go against the grain here and say I, I don't use session zeros. I both because I'm too excited to start running the game myself <laughs> and I I kind of want the game to go in a certain way and maybe that's a little selfish or maybe it's not depending on your point of view but uh, yeah I don't usually run a session zero and I like to get things started right away so I'm I'm less inclined to do session zero for a campaign because I feel like at the start of a campaign, there's, for me, there's something that I want to run. So I'm excited about running a particular system, a particular adventure, and sometimes I'll even, you know, bring the pre-generated characters. So it, a lot of this probably depends on your group. So some groups would <laughs> not enjoy that at all, <laughs> and others would think it's great. So for conventions for drop-in games where you have a lot of people there, um, which has been a lot of my experience over the last many years. Um, Session Zero doesn't work for me. I don't have the same recurring group with with short campaigns, so um, I haven't ran them. But what would you be looking to get out of a good Session Zero? I mean, for me, you you said that you don't want to do a Session Zero because you want it to have a specific sort of tone. For me, it's the the opposite, where I, I have a specific tone in mind that I want and I kind of want to convey that through the session zero. It's not okay. like a let's work together to sort of establish the tone. It's more of a here's the kind of tone for this campaign. It's almost like an interview to see like is this the right <laughs> campaign for you? Like if this this isn't going to be like a like a happy fun time. This is going to be like a sort of gritty grim dark kind of situation here. Um, Which and, is a different kind of yeah. happy fun time. For- <laughs> That's a different kind of happy fun time. Yeah, but it's you sometimes you want to be able to establish like. This is going to be more lighthearted. This is going to be a little bit darker. It's a little bit heavier. And you want to be able to sort of convey those things. And I feel like, at least for, for me, whenever I have a session zero that goes downhill because of people like leaving midway or not hearing the full sort of session zero, it, it always bums me out a little bit because 
I'm trying to establish that tone, especially when people mm-hmm. are making their characters and then trying to bring them to the game and they weren't there for the full session zero and somebody shows up and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm playing um, the silly, the silly, goofy goblin man or the silly, goofy jester guy or the silly, goofy, basically like anything like that. Anything and silly like, and goofy. Yeah, anything silly and goofy. Meanwhile, you're trying to play like a heavy, serious game that's not going to like, you know, Mm-hmm. <laughs> match up very well and it's it's also true in reverse if you're playing a silly game somebody shows up with something very serious yeah angsty make you know sad pants i think that if you're not going to run a session zero you really have to have a strong pitch like this is what the game is going to be like mm-hmm. and probably you want pre-gens and things like that otherwise people will show up with you know you're, you're trying to run like a robin hood king arthur game and they they bring a Jar Jar Binks or, or something <laughs> like that, and it's not going to work for you. Um, so I understand why people run session zeros. I just haven't, I think, mostly because um, I usually have a, a strong thematic idea. Um, I, I think, you know, I try to convey that in the pitch, and I often have pre-gens. So, mm-hmm. But if I, if I wasn't, if I was going to run you know, let's see where this goes. And, uh, you know, I don't have all that stuff. Yeah, probably making sure everyone's on the same page before you start would be a good idea. So that that makes me wonder about the, the next point I want to talk about, which is whether or not you would base your campaign around the characters the players create, or are you expecting them to make characters that fit into the campaign you have in mind? I feel for me, a large part of the responsibility of getting the group together and getting the games running falls on the DM. So I feel like it's it's kind of a nice thing that players can do when they actually base their characters and they base the backstory around what sort of game you're going to be running as opposed to expecting you to do like all the heavy lifting to fit their character into the story. Um, <clears throat> and again, that's that's the same kind of thing with like the tone where it's it's certain people have different expectations going into the game. Certain people expect it to be a different way. And I feel like if you're a player, for the most part, most of the time you need to just show up and you can play in the game. Meanwhile, the DM has to do a lot of the heavy lifting behind the scenes. So I feel like it's, it's especially if I'm a player as well, it's kind of the nice thing to do to, at the very least, ask them questions. Ask your dungeon master or your game master questions about what the campaign is like, what the world is like, and make sure you make a character that fits into the world versus having the Dungeon Master make a world that fits around your character. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I feel like if you have either a set of pre-gens or you have a limited scope of the type of character options they can start with, um, you, I would tend to try to make sure there's elements that reflect their background a little bit, but that would be something like someone's playing a barbarian, so there'd be more interaction with barbarian tribes or Mm -hmm. if someone was a monk, there'd be a monastery. If there's clerics, there'd be, you know, temples and priests and things like that. But I would shy away from the person who's written out, I'm a secret prince and, (laughs) you know, I've got a, I'm, I'm the chosen one and I have the secret heir to the empire of whatever and I, I will inherit the throne when I defeat my my evil nemesis and the yes. dark king whatever and you're and then you're sitting there like um th- none of this is in the <laughs> yeah or they're they're borrowing something from you know their favorite bit of fiction you know mm-hmm. I'm secretly a demon and I'm gonna cause the apocalypse or whatever mm-hmm. else and that's too much because if they fall down a pit trap in the first session and die, <laughs> it feels pretty weird. The apocalypse has been averted. Yeah. Don't worry, guys. We don't need any more heroes to save the day. Yes. They fell down a pit trap. <laughs> yes. So I, I tend to, I'm not quite as extreme as, as no backstories and your backstory is the first three levels, although I don't think that's a bad idea. But I think your, your backstory should be something modest and very short. I think, you know, maybe even something like, Depending on what level you are, you get a sentence per level yeah. <laughs> or something I, like that. I think if you can fit it into like three bullet points, yeah. that's kind of ideal. Yeah. And I think it should be 
if I were to do a session zero, I would make sure people understand your character might die. <laughs> and so don't write this epic backstory because the story of this character might be they fall in a pit and die. <laughs> so that would be a part of, you know, my approach to starting a new campaign is and I've seen I've seen those stories where everyone has a secret destiny and things like that. And I'm sure they can be a lot of fun, but it's typically not how I approach uh, the game. So our our next point is something I know you and I have very different approaches on, and that is a world map. Yeah, I'm personally, I'm, I like world maps a lot, just in terms of, um, I I feel like they're a really good creative uh, outlet. If you want to make them, if you want to, whatever way you end up making them, whether it's a hex map or you're actually like drawing a map, painting a map using software online, it really doesn't matter. But I feel like being able to visualize the sort of world in which you're going to be playing in is not only good for sort of um, your creativity and getting your creativity, um, (laughs) your creative juices flowing, so to say. It's also good for, I find playing the game because especially when, There's certain types of players, and even as the DM, I find I'm like this as well, where I'll want to know the specific distance between two, like, uh, two specific points. And if it's really abstract, then I have to keep track of a lot more stuff. It's really hard. Like, is this journey going to be a day? Is it going to be two days? What if they, well, if they go from the town to the dungeon, it's only a day. But what if they go from the dungeon to the mountain and then uh, you don't know how far that is and so i i feel like it's just good having that map there so you can really visualize where everything is relative to everything else and it's good for your creativity and it's good for the game at least in uh in my games it is Mm -hmm. i like maps as well but my maps tend to be more localized Mm -hmm. even extremely localized to the dungeon or the town or the immediate environs around a, a location and i tend not to have entire worlds so there may be at most a kingdom or you know a peninsula or or something like that Mm -hmm. it's salt marsh the town of salt marsh and you know the immediate uh environment around that sometimes they're not even that much it's the dungeon and a little bit of narrative about getting to the dungeon and then as we play it expands so we start mm-hmm. with a town, and then we go to a dungeon. Now we have two places. Mm-hmm. And then we leave from there and go to a different town. So now we have a little you know, part of a kingdom. And then we get on a boat, and then we sail <laughs> on the boat, and we end up on an island. And then we keep sailing, and we end up in another city. And so gradually, you're exploring the world. So it's sometimes it's just-in-time mapping. Um, mm. Some of it is, you know... I I wouldn't say fully improvised because certainly before each session, I know what's going to happen, but I don't always know, you know, two months ahead of time, what the next town is like until we finish the, the dungeon exploration. And then the party starts talking about going in there. So, yeah. So I, I, I think they look great. Mm -hmm. You're, you're, world maps are awesome. And as a player in your games, I enjoy looking at the map and thinking about where I want to go. Um, but, uh, for my own campaigns, I often focus more on like the town map or, um, sometimes when there's a pre-published map, like when I ran Curse of Strahd, we'll use that, but it's not really a, a world. It's more Mm -hmm. this valley. I definitely, I definitely feel that when you have an entire world on your world map and not just like a, a localized area, you can say it's a full world. It's not. It's not a full <laughs> world. I'm sorry, but it just isn't. Unless you've been playing in the same campaign setting or making your own campaign setting for, honestly, decades, mm-hmm. especially if it's only one person, you're not going to have all of that information fleshed out, yeah. especially not right from the beginning. So mm-hmm. even if you are like boasting, oh, I've got five continents and each one has 100 kingdoms, it's like, yeah, but each kingdom only has like a sentence. Yeah, and so that's so, the same as having one dungeon mm-hmm. with, you know, 500 lines of description for the rooms in it. You're mm-hmm. not really any more detailed, although you call it a world and, and not just a, a single location. So I feel in that way, sort of having the nice world map as sort of a framework and then sort of filling it in more when players go to specific areas, 
I feel like that's that sort of middle ground that's ideal for running a game, at least for me, when you mm-hmm. sort of, you know roughly where everything is in the grand scheme, but you sort of keep it vague until it's actually relevant to the situation, and then you really flesh it out. Yeah, and I can see where if you had a world map and you were to say, this is where the barbarians come from, and this is where the elves live, and this is where the dwarves live, and the dwarves are next door to the goblins, and that's why they're always fighting, and you can get some of those, I guess, geopolitic type (laughs) things based on the map, and that can be helpful, but if you're wanting to run a campaign that's very, you know, metropolitan, and there's uh, PC races from all over living together, then it doesn't really matter very much where no. they came from because they're all just in that that town to start with. So mm-hmm. I, I think that makes more of a difference when you say, okay, you're in the human area yeah. and next door is the halfling area, but you could go and travel to see the elves if you want. Mm-hmm. And so that, I could see where that would be interesting if you had that kind of sandbox style game. And I think that when you have those maps, they do lend themselves more to a sandbox approach to gaming. And that's something you enjoy. Mm-hmm. I, I really enjoy running sort of sandbox games. I feel like when you have especially the local region really fleshed out, and by really fleshed out, I mean like all the, the areas in like a three-day range roughly. Mm-hmm. I feel that that's the, uh, like three days travel, I feel is the best sort of... Um, way to flesh out the surrounding area as to where you can have that really quality sandbox where people can go wherever they feel like, but also it's detailed enough as to where it's not just improv time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if it's all improv, I guess the problem with that is, do you go to the west or the east? Well, it doesn't really matter because you're just going to ask the DM to improvise something. So I, I like knowing that it makes a difference when Mm -hmm. I'm asked to make a decision about something. And if I'm just waiting for more improv, then I almost throw it over to the DM and say, (laughs) just tell me, (laughs) tell me what happens to my character. (laughs) Where, where do I go? Yeah. I don't care. Yeah. (laughs) Which way am I going? Which way would you prefer? Yeah. And so where is the interesting thing? Where do the winds of fate take my character? And then Mm -hmm. I'll pick up things when I I can start making meaningful choices again. It's it's like the cutscene. Yeah. All of a sudden, (laughs) There's like a, the cinematic bars appear at the top and bottom of the screen. That's right. Yeah. So you see, we see the party traveling over a mountain range and then they're traveling through gullies and the woods and things, and then they reach whatever the next destination is. And I I think for me, I tend not to do hex crawls where I'm leaving it completely open, you know, which direction do you want to go? West or East or Mm -hmm. North or South? And instead they're a bunch of location-based adventures that have connections between them. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the city and you hear rumors about, or you find a map or something to uh, the haunted tower or something like that, you would then travel to the haunted tower, but you would travel to the haunted tower. You wouldn't just be sort of wandering aimlessly through the woods. And there could be encounters on the way. Would you like to go to the haunted tower? Nah. <laughs> Halfway you decide you're not going to do it and you just get lost. Yeah. So I I tend to run my games like that. So in, so I, And again, where the, the world map isn't, certainly a hex-based one, isn't as, as useful to me as much as the more detailed town maps and mm-hmm. dungeon maps. And even that technique that I like to do where I have a, uh, a stack of cards with mm-hmm. location information on them. And then we're, we're placing those down on the table and people are deciding which of these cards they're going to go to, or they're drawing one at random. And, and then after it's being put into play, they can move back to it. So, um, I have a different sort of approach to, mm-hmm. to that. And I've seen you do that in some of your games as well. So you, you sort of have a hybrid between, sort of my approach, I'd say, and that that uh, more classic hex crawl yeah. uh, approach to things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in your, so one of the things that I struggle with, with the idea of a hex crawl is create, I don't, on one hand, I don't want to improvise too much and you have to improvise a little bit because yeah. you, you can't create everything, but I don't want to ask the players to make choices when there's, <laughs> when I don't have a concrete answer to what's 
between the different choices. Mm -hmm. So I don't say, do you want to go west or east? And meanwhile, I'm just making up crap. (laughs) I want to know what's in those two directions. And so I don't want to do too much prep. Mm -hmm. So I I like to have, I do a fair amount of prep before I run a game, but I don't want to do prep that's completely wasted and doesn't get used. Um, So I find, you know, special NPCs can be a a real way, especially with... um, with a world map and if you're trying to play honest and not move things around behind the scenes and, and things like that if you're trying to play it honest and things are where you've said they are then i don't want to do a lot of work building npcs and it's just wasted effort <laughs> that's a, a thing that i like to do for my sandboxes is whenever i roll a random encounter there's like you wanted to say i think that i like to do for my sandboxes when it is whenever i roll random encounter right Alexa, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so a sort of thing that I do in my games is whenever I have a random encounter, I make sure that there is a chance of, instead of encountering like a monster or even like a friendly um, sort of generic NPC, there's like a specific category where you encounter like a named NPC, okay. and then it's the most relevant NPC in that current moment. If you're in the swamp, you're probably not going to be finding the uh, the aristocrat like walking <laughs> around in the swamp. But maybe you'll find like an explorer or a cartographer who's like traveling through the area, trying to like you know map everything. Mm-hmm. And so I find that by assigning important NPCs to be in this role where they can be encountered basically anywhere, it it lets you. Uh, use these sort of NPCs that you, you want to, even if players don't go in places you expect. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's a, good, that's a good technique. So when you're writing out your NPCs, do you ever find you put so much work into them that you become protective of them and you worry that the players will either ignore them or attack them and kill them or otherwise not let that NPC turn into this sort of story element you had hoped for absolutely all of the time (laughs) (laughs) i feel that my biggest issue that i have is i love prepping for games Mm -hmm. but i tend to over prep and that includes almost anything including npcs so when an npc shows up and people are like oh i'm gonna attack this guy i'm like really do you need to do that yeah and so then you end up getting into this thing where you're like okay well i guess if i like run another game in the same sort of scenario again, then that NPC can show up again and however long that will be. Except then if the players find out, sometimes players get a little bit weird, but they're like, you mean our our choices meant nothing the whole time? And they're like, no, they did. And if you keep playing in the same game, like your choices will still have the same effect. But if I'm playing with a different group, I have all this prep prepared right right here. So I'm going to be, you know, reusing some of the same stuff. Oh, of course, of course. Mm-hmm. And if you end up publishing any of your stuff, like I did with the the Advanced Ancient Academy, I've run that tons of times, and I know other people have run that. And I, it would be a shame if you know mm-hmm. you run it once and then you, like, you can't update run it everyone. Again. It's already been cleared. <laughs> Stan's party's already been through. Everything's taken. Mm-hmm. Sorry. I feel like that's almost a very. Um like a very old school sort of way of playing it where you have all these different players who are coming in and Stan's party has already <laughs> cleared. Yeah. Like the I, dungeon think they and did, you... I think that the, the, the folks in Lake Geneva did run campaigns like that. Yeah. Where, you know, if the other group got Gary to run a session for them, they might <laughs> clear the dungeon. And then when the other group shows up too bad, they've already got the, the loot. I've... And I think that's cool, mm-hmm. but wow, I, I don't know a lot of people are still running games like that. So you were in my big game that I ran for three years, and it's one of the biggest modern games mm-hmm. I've heard of. I know I have a, a, a friend in in uh, Indonesia, and he runs big games for his, his classes he teaches. But this was week by week by week <laughs> for like three years, and we, we had uh, over 75 players, and we had multiple groups that conceivably could have started doing things to interact with each other. They Mm -hmm. didn't really because they they were off on adventures in different areas, but they could have. And I think we had occasions where people 
traveled between the groups and they would <laughs> they would show up in in the the other a, a adventuring company it's like find out what they've been uh, working on get to there first and then vandalize the place. <laughs> so they weren't antagonistic with each other so i think that would be a big <laughs> the part of elves that. were here right like a, as like a zed instead of the elves <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i could see that but i think you'd you'd be running a really different campaign mm -hmm. and i think sooner or later they would ask you to run that big session where they can fight. <laughs> I've, I've heard that that was partially where the origin of, obviously it's like a, like a literature thing as well, was part of where the law versus chaos came from. But I, I've heard a large part of it was almost like sports jerseys, where you're part of law team or chaos team. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so you had like the, the law group and the chaos group, and you didn't usually have members mixing between them. And so they were like actually upset with each other in real life some of the time <laughs> as a player one of the things that sometimes makes me crazy is when there's another player in the group who insists on playing a style of character and you're like why would my character hang out <laughs> with this person and even if they get killed or they they leave another one will come in and they'll be just as obnoxious as this one why would my character deal with this and so i kind of do like that idea that there'd be different mm -hmm. groups within like a big campaign that people would gravitate towards mm -hmm. um certainly uh there were people who showed up at our big campaign with their friends and <laughs> <laughs> they you know they had a real different approach to the game and they mm -hmm. were almost like little factions within the game Often they didn't stay for very long. Often they, they didn't stay for long. Often they were very chaotic. <laughs> yeah, they were usually very chaotic. Sometimes they died really quickly. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, I've heard a lot of people say 5e is hard to kill the players. Or kill the characters, rather. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to kill the players. But the DM no. is pissed today. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not hard to kill the characters if the players are re the players not the characters the players yeah. are really chaotic and really have bad strategy because they'll mm. do all sorts of ridiculous things no healing you know charge ahead not not look both ways before crossing the dungeon street um you know they'll find ways of of, of killing themselves off pretty quick i've i've even played in 5e games where people like objectively like they make a couple of questionable decisions but like they don't make horrible decisions and they still get themselves killed just due to like the dice and everything that happens yeah. so whenever people are like oh it's really hard to kill off a 5e character i'm like yeah they make all the right choices yeah and as soon as they start splitting the party mm -hmm. and i i never dissuade the players <laughs> from splitting the party because it's usually <laughs> where some of the 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 funniest gaming stories come from uh, when one or more characters runs away, uh, you have, you have a friend that, uh, uh, I love being in our games because he runs all the time and it always makes for a fun, uh, session when the wizard has, has run off into the woods by himself and <laughs> <laughs> he's low on hit points and, and magic and, uh, uh, you know, he's in the, the woods alone at night. And so that's kind of fun. So... When you're running a, a campaign, do you like to write everything from scratch or would you ever either base it in a pre-published setting like Eberron or the Forgotten Realms or would you even pick up some pre-existing modules and say, this is our game for tonight and, you know, I'm just going to add a little bit of, you know, world lore around this, but we're, we're basically just going to run this out of the book. I found that when I was a little bit younger, I wanted to make everything from scratch. Like, everything needed to be from scratch. A homebrew world, homebrew adventures, homebrew everything. And I find that can be fun, but it's one of the easiest ways to have DM burnout. Especially yeah. if you're running it weekly, or bi-weekly, or even monthly. Just knowing that you have to do all this prep, and I over-prepare. So mm -hmm. knowing you have to do these, like eight, nine, even 10 hours to prep before you run a game and you only have a limited amount of time to do it, it's a lot of pressure on yourself. Mm -hmm. Whereas I find if you just pick up a module or you pick up an adventure and you just run it with like slight slight changes maybe to keep it interesting, it's just so much easier. Yeah, <laughs> it's so much sure. easier. When I was running the weekly game, it was so helpful that I could run through a series of pre 
published modules, and then sometimes add little bits and, and side adventures that I would write and, and things of that nature. But if I had to write three years worth of weekly sessions for, you know, that many players, I, I think I could see myself getting tired and burned out. But because I could let other people do the writing some of the time and then focus on DMing, I think it, it's sort of like if you're the DM, you're sort of like a film director and you don't always want to be the writer as well. Sometimes you want to work with a talented writer and mm -hmm. they produce the module or the adventure <laughs> and then you focus on, on mm -hmm. running it. And I think that's a, a completely fine way to do things. I remember uh, this was years ago. Uh, I must have been like 12 or 13 at the time. I was playing a, it was a, it was, I was running it. It was a 5e game that I was running and I was doing everything homebrew and it was really starting to get to me all the, the burnout. Mm -hmm. And then I switched to a, like a published module and I, I sort of changed the uh, focus a little bit and I integrated it nice and like smoothly, but then I sort of sw switched gears and it was like a pressure had been lifted off of my shoulders. Yeah. Cause I'm like, I, all that I need to do is like read for an hour yeah. and I'll know exactly how to run the, the yeah. session. Yeah. I think w with pre-published adventures, the real trick is making sure that you can find something that matches your tone and mm -hmm. approach to the game. So I've seen some excellent adventures and I, I've run them and I had a lot of fun with them and they were great. And then there were some other ones that, you know, I cut short. You know, I was running them and I was like, I don't love this. And I would cut them short and we would move on to something else. And I've also read some adventures where I cannot imagine running that <laughs> for, you know, the, the, the kind of game that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's, that's the biggest trick with running someone else's adventure is, is making sure, you know, you almost have to have a, your own internal session zero with, the, <laughs> with reading the, the work from that writer and making sure that it's, it's something that's compatible with your approach. I think it can change a lot too, just depending on the way that you sort of spin things. Mm -hmm. You could make something very lighthearted and silly, or you could make something like the same adventure really like dark and gritty, just depending on how you phrase everything and how you how you sort of establish things and set the tone. It could be, oh, the monsters killed another man. <laughs> or it could be like, oh my goodness, there's something and it's killing everybody. It's dismembering them. It's hanging their heads from the chains on the roof and mm -hmm. like you could make it horrific and like yeah so so i think you know one of the, one of the things that i think makes a a big deal to having a successful campaign and this is either in your your session zero or in your you know pitch to your players but making sure that everyone has the same understanding of the tone mm -hmm. that you're going for and if they're not all 100% on the same page, they're at least compatible, mm -hmm. right? So even in a horror movie, you sometimes have a comic relief character <laughs> as long as they don't turn the entire thing into a farce, yeah. right? So I think I think that can be also a challenge with, with adapting other people's work. And if you have to do so much prep to change you know, Strixhaven into a survival <laughs> horror game, you might have been better to run Curse of Strahd or yeah. run, you know, into the weird and wild or, or some other campaign setting or, or adventure that, that already has the tone that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you're writing your, your, new campaigns do you think about the tone a lot and how how do you make sure that your tone stays consistent or do you not make it stays consistent i feel definitely like my games generally have a very consistent tone even um like for different campaigns they generally tend to have the same sort of tone which is sort of halfway between light and dark mm -hmm. i'd say it's not like super gritty but it's not super silly either there's, I feel like there's moments where it's like grittier and moments where it's a little bit sillier, but w even when I say that, it's not like far in either direction. It's only like, oh, this NPC is a funny voice or, oh, this monster is actually pretty scary. It's never like something horrific or something that's like absurd and over the top. And so I feel like when you have the same tone, 
that you've been working with for a long time, you sort of uh, subconsciously start writing things in that same tone. So you don't even really need to think about it. But conveying that to the players is often the hard part if they have a different idea. Mm-hmm. And I think if if you have players that are coming to the game with a lot of experience with a very singular approach to gaming, right? They, they've watched hundreds of hours of their favorite, you know, live stream D&D critical role or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. And they, that. That's a very specific approach to the game. They may think, hey, that's all games. Mm-hmm. And it might be a bit, you know, disconcerting for them to find out, oh, that's that's not the, the style <laughs> of game you might run. Um, or if they watch a lot of a, a certain type of media, they, they love, you know, they've been watching hundreds of hours of One Piece, and that is how they're going to approach <laughs> every <laughs> D&D session. It's going to be lighthearted uh, anime. Um there's nothing wrong with that if everyone's on the same page, but I think where things usually go off the rails is when one player wants to take it in a very different direction than everyone else. Um, so I think for sure establishing that tone up front, whether it's session zero or that strong pitch, um, I like to make reference to movies, um, music, uh, if I can find or draw some artwork and say it's going to be <laughs> like this, um, I find that can help set that tone. Uh, and I like the idea that there's there's room for different types of games and different types of tone. Mm-hmm. So you know, even though, and, and you know, I, I'm sort of kind of bashing on Strixhaven a little <laughs> bit, but that it's cool that that exists for people who want that. You know, so people mm-hmm. who want a light, friendly, not, you know, survival horror type game that, that's, that's safe and light and everything. It's great that they have that. And if they're all enjoying that together, then that's awesome. Um, and I really do. Mm-hmm. No kidding. I love that they made it so clear with the, yeah. the, with the artwork and everything on the cover that that is not what I'm looking for. No, but that's a really good thing yeah. because I would be disappointed if they had made that look like, um, you know, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, which is kind of a little darker. Mm-hmm. If the book had looked like that, I might have been, oh, this is exciting. I'm going to I'm gonna mm-hmm. check this out. This might be cool and find out it's, you know, magic baristas and, you know, things that aren't exciting to me. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that's great about the way they pitch that so that, you know, I can focus on, on, you know, other stuff. With sort of having that sort of difference in styles as well, that's also the reason why, even though there's certain editions of D&D that I've never played, I have no desire to play them. Um, I, I've never played, I have no desire to play fourth edition. Uh, third edition has way too many rules for me to even want to comprehend that. But just the fact that they, they have different versions of the game, I like that a lot. Mm-hmm. And for that reason, whenever people are bashing on, like, 4th edition, they're like, oh, 4th edition sucks. <laughs> I'm like, I probably wouldn't like 4th edition, yeah. but I like that it exists. Because yeah. you know what? If you want to sit at the table and be like, I want to play, like, tabletop World of Warcraft with my friends, yeah. you th- you go ahead and you play tabletop World of Warcraft. There are, you know, we, I ran a, a 4E campaign, a short one. It didn't last a really long time. I think we only lasted maybe about a half dozen sessions at most. And there are things about it that I liked. I thought it was great for getting new people in pretty quickly. Um, I, it didn't have a lot of the elements of classic D and D that I really enjoy. It didn't really focus as much on the, inventory management and um exploration as much it was it was a lot more tactical um i don't even know if you could do fourth edition theater of the mind style i think that would be (laughs) that would be very challenging (laughs) um so but we we did have fun with it for a little while but it's it it's not you know as i've gotten a little bit older i'm much better about other people <laughs> like things that I don't. Mm. So it's fine that it's there. And I think um, in the right hands, it, it, it could be a lot of fun for the right group. It's just not, it's not the right fit for me mm-hmm. for, for the games um, that I want to run. And I mean, there's other games as well where a big part of that game is 
collaborative world building. So people come to the game and the DM hasn't done that much prep and the players are saying, well, actually in this town, there's a, you know, a thieves guild and, you know, it's an abandoned pirate ship out in the harbor and they're introducing those elements and that becomes part of the world Mm -hmm. and lots of people enjoy those games tremendously and I'm just not one of them. (laughs) (laughs) I don't, I don't like that approach and I've you know I went to film school and I did a lot of uh, theater sports and you know creative writing exercises where it would be that sort of collaborative storytelling and for me personally that's not what I'm looking for in a game like D&D but wh- what do you feel about with your own personal, and it's fine. We, I think we both agree it's fine. It exists. But for you personally, do you like collaborative world building or do you prefer that that's something that you as the DM do exclusively? I'm going to be completely honest. I feel that it's best done exclusively by the, the DM mm-hmm. because if you have different people contributing, again, different people have different ideas about tones, different ideas about what's cool, what isn't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it can almost become this, like, writing fight. (laughs) That's worst case scenario. But best case scenario, it's this um, sort of uh, mismatched, cobbled together setting of different tones and themes. And at worst, it's just a a fighting match, basically, between players where, oh, yeah, well, my my king's the coolest king because he (laughs) has the the sword of whatever. Nuh-uh, my character the cool wizard of this tower actually has the shield that can block that and then you're basically just playing those ridiculous games that like grade schoolers play yeah where they 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 all like declare that they have all these increasingly powerful items that they use to block each other and yeah i play i played in a game called fiasco and it lets you create sort of a coen brothers type movie of you know petty crooks with terrible plots and everything goes off the rails and I think it does tend to get a little zany quickly but if you're playing for laughs it can be fun and I think that's the same reason shows like whose line is it anyway Mm -hmm. you know are a lot of fun to watch and they're they make you laugh and um they're very entertaining I don't think I would want to watch a drama show like that where they were just improvising everything <laughs> as they went. And I think even shows like Lost where, you know, you, you become aware that the writing team is making it up as mm-hmm. they go become frustrating because you know what's in the box. I wonder what's in the box. <laughs> Nothing. It's just a box and you haven't decided what's in the box. And so I it, I have a hard time being excited about that yeah so again different personality types and things but uh, i think we're on the same page with that that uh, um we we both i think like to do a lot of prep mm-hmm. and uh and then share that with our players so one of the things about a campaign as opposed to a one shot is how do you end it and what happens if it ends sooner than you expect because all the players die again not the players <laughs> well, well that's very whoa sad. that got really dark yeah <laughs> that's very sad if all the players die but what if all the characters die what if it's a, a a tpk a total party kill and you didn't get to where you were hoping to and in your approach to games is that fine because that's just how it goes or would you be disappointed with that and try to steer that towards not happening and give the player some sort of plot armor I don't like giving players plot armor at all. And even though I'm I'm fine with when characters die, if the entire party dies in like a TPK, I'd feel slightly bummed out. And I have done in the past really, really weird, messed up scenario. There was a game that I ran where one of the players, their character died and they made a deal with a, with a demon and their character w- went to hell. <laughs> <laughs> this game was effed up, but they they basically had to escape with um, basically death. Mm-hmm. They found his his boat and he ferried them back across the river Styx, and so they were able to escape. And it was this big thing. Uh, I didn't like the way that I handled that. I thought that it was kind of over the top and ridiculous. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> and so I feel like there's certain things that you can do to try to prevent there being like a TPK kind of moment by still letting the character like live on or maybe have to do a quest and an mm-hmm. afterlife of sorts to get back to the the world. But I, I feel like the best way of going about things is to just accept that what happens happens and yeah, everybody died. It's a little bit of a bummer. Let's make characters that are maybe connected in some way to this yeah. previous uh, group. Maybe they want to avenge their deaths. At the rescue party. Yeah, the, the rescue party. Or even even if they have like an, a, a quest where they expressly like, oh, this powerful cleric will revive them if they get the bodies back or mm-hmm. even something like that. Or that's like the next goal. And by the time they do that, maybe they're like, maybe we don't want that. Maybe we want to keep playing as this group. Mm-hmm. So for my games, I've had one shot where if everyone dies, well, that's just how it goes, <laughs> yeah. really. I've also ran the big three-year-long campaign where we had so many players. There was only one time where we almost had a TPK where they were all bunched up at the bottom of a tower in Castle Ravenloft. And Strahd <laughs> had the possibility of raining fireballs down and killing everyone. And I did not pull the trigger on that. And I have always sort of felt mixed feelings about that. On one hand, if I had done it, I think I would have, you know, been consistent with my approach <laughs> to games, which I roll the dice in the open. Yeah. And I, I try to be fair and all the rest. But I would have had all sorts of crying kids um, <laughs> and it would have been a real bummer. And then the whole thing would have ended. And, yeah. you know, I would have had upset parents and the whole thing. So I think for that specific group of of people it was parents and kids and and teens i think that i probably did make the right call to not have straw do a tpk (laughs) but i think in general i try to always let the players have the opportunity to run and usually that stops tpks from happening Mm -hmm. um because I've had good fortune in having clever players and usually most of them are cautious and and there's only a couple who are not cautious and and they die, their characters die, again, not the player, Mm -hmm. characters die and then that's a good lesson for everyone else to be even more careful. Um, So I haven't had to deal with that so much. Um, And the whole time I've played D&D, I think there's only ever been two times where I felt bad about a scenario like that. Once when I first started getting back into D&D as an adult, and it was in the original Ancient Academy, um, and I, I, I made some changes to the advanced version in Advanced Ancient Academy for the spider encounter. Um, I didn't like rules as written the way roll the dice to see if you're surprised. Oh, you're surprised. Roll for attack. Oh, it hit you. Make a saving throw versus poison. I failed. Mm -hmm. You're dead. And I I didn't like that there was very little ability to recognize you're in danger and run away because I do like those Scooby-Doo moments more Mm -hmm. than I like the slasher film jump out and you die kind of moments i I don't feel those are as exciting in Mm dnd i think when the players recognize oh no run run it's (laughs) it's i think it's more exciting for everyone so that's like horror games as well you're playing a horror game Mm -hmm. it's not you're walking in some games do where they have like a cheap jump scare and then they just get you but those aren't the good ones the good ones are when you're walking through like a scary thing and you're like oh, shoot, where are they, where are they? You see them come around the corner, it's just playing the scary music, they're chasing you, and you're, yeah. out of, you're running, and then you're like, oh, shoot, oh, shoot, oh, shoot, yeah. trying yeah. to get away. That's the more exciting type yeah. of horror game, and at least in my opinion. Yeah, so I try to avoid, when I'm if I'm writing my own adventures, scenarios where the players don't have an opportunity to recognize, oh, I screwed up, and... Like, I have to run, I have to lose some resources in some way. Um, So I've I've been fortunate that I haven't had a lot of TPKs, um, but uh, uh, they certainly would end a campaign. So what would be the good way that you would want to see a campaign end? Ideally, I'm... I know that like people are like, oh, it's got to go out with a bang and not go out with a whatever. I'm like... 
in some ways, I kind of like it where there's just, like, one sort of continuous campaign that, like, keeps going. And, mm-hmm. like, if you're playing the game with the same group, it's going to be at least in the same world, if not the same characters mm-hmm. or the same sort of whatever. Realistically, if you know that the campaign's going to end, you should... I feel like doing some sort of, like, special thing to tie everything up and tie off all the, the loose ends. I feel like that's... I feel like that's good. Mm-hmm. But if it were up to me... In most case scenarios, it would just be extended hiatus until the next time we end up playing, in which case it sort of, just sort of picks up even like a couple months later in the game world. Yeah. It keeps going. Yeah, I think I think that's that's ideal as well. So the big campaign, when it ended, in retrospect, I wish that I had done a celebration, you know, the end of Star Wars, A New Hope type thing. <laughs> People get their medals and, and everyone's happy and, and we end on that note. Instead, <laughs> I ended with um, the majority of the characters uh, going to the Black Lodge from Twin Peaks <laughs> and being trapped there. And the idea at the time was, well, if we're on hiatus for six months, they'll they'll get out in six months. And, uh, you know, it ended up being more than six months, more than six months. And then the kids who were in the game were, you know, some of them were eight, 10, 12 at the time. Now, they're, you know, 18, 16. Mm-hmm. And realistically, that campaign is, is never going to come back. Mm-hmm. Um, so that campaign is done. So I've run some one shots continuing the story for a couple of the characters, mm-hmm. but you know, the, the campaign is done. And, uh, you know, I probably, if I could do it all over again, had it end on a slightly different note uh, than the one it did. Because it was almost, in some ways, a TPK. I, I think there were, like, 20 or 30 people towards the end who were trapped in that sort of, like, weird, like, uh, Twin Peaks dimension. Yes. And I only think, like, four or five people actually got out. <laughs> yes, so, so it, was, it was borderline uh, TPK. So we, we had a, a massive number of, of characters. But just like, um, uh, you know, the, the, the revisited Twin Peaks, you know, who knows what will happen in 20 years. I'll be an old man and I will um, run D&D for a bunch of people who... <laughs> <laughs> Once upon a time were uh, my players at, uh, <laughs> at the All Ages game. Anyway, this has been a great discussion, and these are our ideas for how to prep for a new campaign. It would be great to hear from people in the comments if they have some tips for what they would do if they're starting up a new campaign. I'm actually at the moment planning a new campaign, and I know, Liam, that you have uh, a lot of prep you're continuing to do for your online games. Mm -hmm. And it'll be great to see if we have some feedback from people. And uh, maybe we'll take some of your advice and uh, run with it. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks very much, everyone. And hopefully by the next time we post another episode of this podcast, we'll have a name for it. (laughs) Instead of just starting with who we are. Mm -hmm. But until then, we'll talk to you soon.